Okay, I think uh, we can make a start. So I'm going to deal with uh, the formation of a precipitate from a supersaturated matrix. And the precipitate may have a different chemical composition and it may have a different crystal structure or even uh, if it has the same crystal structure, it might have a different crystallographic orientation. So what do you think are the processes which will control its growth rate? We've got a particle which is attempting to grow in a matrix. It has a different chemical composition, a different orientation or crystal structure or both. What do you think are the processes that control its growth? Processes. Okay, and any, even if it's just one. Um, you only like the temperature or concentration. Yeah, so obviously if it's uh, growing with a different composition, then solute must diffuse ahead of the interface. You know, like when you grow um, ice from water, you would have to reject salt into the water, wouldn't you? Uh, you were going to say well, something? I was just going to say diffusion. Yeah. Uh, alternatively, if it's growing really rapidly and there is actually uh, an enthalpy change, a latent heat of transformation, then you might actually have to diffuse heat away from the interface as well. Anything else? What about this different crystal structure or different orientation? You've actually got to take atoms and transfer them across the boundary into a different structure or a different orientation, haven't we? So there's going to be some sort of an activation barrier there. Now, in general, there might be a whole series of processes which control the rate of a reaction. And each of these processes will dissipate energy. Okay. And I've got an electrical analogy here for you to look at, where, say for example, this could be the process which uh, describes the diffusion of solute ahead of the interface and is represented here by a certain value of an electrical resistor. The transfer of atoms across the boundary may be dissipating some of the free energy, in which case uh, we represent it by another resistor and I could carry that series of resistors on for each of the different processes which limit the growth of the particle. What does the current represent in this analogy? Flux. The flux, but we're looking, uh, so I want you to give me a more precise description of the flux. We've got a precipitate which is growing. The, the actual material that the, the precipitate is diffusing. Yeah. Well, from the solution to the precipitate particle. Okay. I mean, that's one of the processes. But when we are monitoring the growth of a precipitate, what are we monitoring? It's the size as a function of time, isn't it? So here, this is the velocity of the interface, and these are the processes which are resisting the movement of that interface. This is the total free energy change when you form the precipitate. And some of that free energy is dissipated in this particular process, and some of it is dissipated in this process. Um, and, of course, in the electrical analogy, it's simply the current times the voltage being dissipated in this process and the current times this dissipation in this particular process. I'm going to talk today about just one of the processes, that is uh, diffusion-controlled growth. Uh, what do I mean by diffusion-controlled growth? I mean that almost all of the free energy is being dissipated in the diffusion of solute ahead of the interface. The remainder, you know, for example, the transfer of atoms across the boundary, doesn't actually take up much of the free energy. In other words, it's not controlling the process. Uh, alternatively, if we had interface controlled growth, then most of the free energy would be dissipated in the transfer of uh, atoms across the boundary, and therefore the diffusion wouldn't be the limiting process. We can have mixed control, where these are comparable in value, and then we have to take that into account. I'll show you how to take that into account later. But just to um, summarize, 
we have a single phase alpha here and I cool it rapidly into the two phase field so that nothing has changed at time equals zero and what it wants to do is it wants to divide into alpha of this composition and the precipitate beta of this composition and beta is clearly richer in solute than the average composition of the alpha which existed at high temperature so what we are going to have to do is to draw solute from the matrix towards the precipitate for it to grow so everybody happy with this? this represents the average composition of the alpha when it was a single phase. In other words, it's the composition of your material. The terminology I'm using here, C alpha beta means it's the composition of the alpha which is in equilibrium with the beta. This is a phase diagram. And this is the composition of the beta which is in equilibrium with the alpha. When we talk about the solubility of a solute in a particular phase, you have to describe it with respect to another phase. You can't say that the solubility of uh, gas in water is so much without taking account of the solubility in the atmosphere above the water. So this is the solubility in alpha which is in equilibrium with beta and the solubility in beta which is in equilibrium with alpha. Uh, when we start the precipitation process, the concentration is C0 everywhere, we just have a single phase, right? but it's super saturated because we've now quenched it into the two-phase field. So beta will eventually start to grow by a nucleation process. We are neglecting nucleation at the moment. And the composition of the beta will be given by the phase diagram for that temperature. So this is uh, the amount of solute in beta which is in equilibrium with alpha. And at the boundary in the alpha, the minimum concentration that the phase can reach, alpha can reach, is its equilibrium solubility, which is C alpha beta. And this is the far field concentration, which is C naught. So we are assuming this is very, very long in this direction, so that we never start to disturb the composition far away from the interface. That simply fires the mathematics. It's not a problem to deal with, but I don't want to get things too complicated. So we'll assume always that the far field concentration C0 remains constant. And this is the position of the interface. Is everybody happy with that diagram? Do you understand it? But this is the beta phase. This is the equilibrium composition of the alpha and the equilibrium composition of the beta. And clearly, we've had to absorb this much solute from the matrix to allow uh, beta to grow. And that solute is coming in by diffusion towards the interface and therefore we are depleting the matrix of solute, right? Then of course we have to transfer atoms across the boundary uh, from alpha to beta and there will be an activation barrier there uh, because the crystal structures are not identical and the orientation is not that the same but we are going to ignore this. We are going to say that almost all the free energy is being dissipated in the diffusion process, so we don't need to think about this process. I'll come back to this later on. Okay, so we've got this precipitate uh, growing inside the matrix. The first approximation I'm going to make to treat this is that the variation of concentration here is linear. In other words, the gradient is constant. It, in practice, it's an error function. But I don't want to go into the mathematics of integrating an error function, so I'm going to assume that it's a constant gradient. It's a very good approximation. Uh, when this particle grows a little bit, This red curve, uh, so after a short amount of time, the interface will have moved, and this will be the new concentration distribution. So basically, we've had to sort of add that much solute to this material. Okay, that's the amount of solute that has been added to the beta particle. 
and the rate at which that solute is absorbed is simply that, take away that, multiplied by the rate of interface motion. So this is simply the rate at which we are adding solute to the beta particle. And the composition of the beta is C beta, that of alpha is C alpha. If we take the difference, multiply it by the velocity of the interface, then that's the rate at which solute is absorbed by the precipitate. How is that solute getting there? By diffusion. So we've got to match the diffusion flux to the rate at which solute is being absorbed if, if these concentrations are going to remain constant. And equilibrium requires that they remain at those values. So the interface will only move if the solute can arrive at the right rate for the precipitate to absorb the solute. And of course, the diffusion flux is simply given by the diffusion coefficient times the gradient of concentration. That's fixes for slope. So this is the rate at which the flux, uh, the solute is coming towards the interface. So we have two terms. The first one is the rate at which solute is absorbed by the precipitate. Second one, the rate at which solute is arriving at the interface so that it can be absorbed by the precipitate. Of course, this gradient dc by dx in our approximation is straightforward. It's, it's going to be a constant value. Are you happy with these two conditions? Okay, now they must be equal if the concentrations at the interface are going to remain fixed. So we set, we write this equation that the rate of solute absorbed is equal to the flux towards the interface and we approximate the gradient as this value, take away this value, divided by this diffusion distance delta x. simply the gradient of the concentration profile ahead of the interface. <coughs> now, we've got the velocity of the interface here, but we've got one unknown, haven't we? What is that unknown? Let's assume we know the diffusion coefficient. What we want to solve for is the velocity of the interface. So what is the unknown in this equation? Delta x, that's right. We, we don't know what this diffusion distance is. Now, we can find that by doing a mass balance because the total amount of solute that has been absorbed in the precipitate must be equal to the total amount of solute that has been removed from the matrix. So if you do a mass balance, then basically that's the amount of solute which has been absorbed in the precipitate, because we started off with C0 everywhere. And that is the total amount that has been depleted from the matrix, because again we started off with C0 everywhere. So from that mass balance, you see that C beta minus C0 times the size of the precipitate, x, must be equal to the area of this triangle, which is C naught minus C alpha, times delta x, and it's half because this is a triangle. Half base times height. <coughs> so we now have a second equation, with uh, delta x being the only unknown. So we can substitute for delta x in terms of these terms here. We do the previous equation where we balance the rate at which solute is being absorbed by the diffusion flux towards the interface. Yeah, is everything clear so far? Okay, so we had this equation here with an unknown, the value of delta x, and we now have an overall mass balance between the total solute absorbed into the precipitate and the total solute taken away from the matrix 
we simply substitute delta x in here, and then we have nothing except dx by dt. So that's just a substitution now, dx by dt. We have a diffusion coefficient. We know our starting chemical composition, C0. We have these values from the phase diagram. And this is the size of the precipitate. So if I take x onto this side and dt onto that side, I end up with an equation like this. And when I integrate that, you'll see that x is proportional to diffusion coefficient times time, square root of that. Do you remember this term? So the size of the precipitate will vary with the square root of time. And of course, we have all these terms from the phase diagram. I simply haven't written them down here for simplicity. So we could actually calculate an absolute velocity of the interface. This size has units of surface? Sorry? This size has units of surface? Uh, no, uh, we are considering one-dimensional growth. So it's a very good point. Uh, again, in order to simplify the derivation, I'm just looking at one-dimensional growth, so flat interface moving. Two-dimensional growth would be a cylinder growing. Three-dimensional would be a sphere growing. Now, one-dimensional growth does happen. Uh, for example, um, the growth of a layer on another surface. So if you look at uh, ice forming on a pond, then the ice thickens by the diffusion of heat through the ice. So it's one-dimensional growth of ice. And the rate at which that ice will grow, if I plot the thickness of the ice versus time, then it would be a parabolic curve. So the growth rate slows down as the ice becomes thicker and thicker. Any ideas why? Yeah, the gradient of this graph is decreasing all the time. Or the heat is diffused through thicker from the other Exactly. So as the ice becomes thicker, the heat has to diffuse through a larger and larger distance. What about in this analogy? Why, why do we have a parabolic growth? Well, the, you're presuming that the x increase over time? Yeah. As I remove more and more solid, this will become gentler and gentler and gentler. And therefore, the diffusion flux becomes smaller, and therefore the velocity increases. So in all of these diffusion controlled processes, uh, at least for one dimensional growth, you will get a parabolic growth flow. So things will vary with the square root of time. So this, this is actually quite an important result. Uh, even if I make my theory incredibly complicated to take account of the shape of the concentration profile or make it two-dimensional growth, three-dimensional growth, if I allow the far field concentration to change, the essence of the derivation doesn't change that we will have the square roots of time in the argument. Of course, if I allow the far field concentration to change, eventually it deviates from parabolic growth. Yeah, because if C0 is decreasing all the time towards C alpha, then eventually the growth rate becomes zero. So if I just write down the approximations that we made, we assume that we had a constant gradient. We assume that the far field concentration doesn't change. Next. And that means that this growth goes on forever, which is not true in practice. Of course. Eventually, it will become zero as C naught drops towards C alpha. Obviously, let me see if. If this value is decreasing towards C alpha, when it reaches C alpha, the growth will stop. The one-dimensional growth is not an approximation. There are many cases where you get one-dimensional growth because when you put two different materials together, you join them, there will be a reaction layer formed. And that reaction layer will thicken by one-dimensional growth. So this is a typical example of 
uh, parabolic thickening of a precipitate as a function of time. And the reason why it's parabolic is that as my particle becomes bigger, in order to have mass conservation, this gradient becomes gentler because the area under this tri in this triangle must increase as the precipitate grows. So the diffusion distance is increasing as a function of time, and that's the reason why we have parabolic growth. Now, this derivation is, is straightforward, but we've actually come up with an important result, because look, we are using thermodynamics. Where does the thermodynamics come in? Where in this calculation have we used thermodynamics? With the rates of diffusion. Uh, the diffusion? Yeah. No. No, because the diffusion coefficient is a kinetic. Oh, yeah. oh, I see what you mean. The concentration dependence of diffusion could. Yeah, well, we did this morning, but the diffusion coefficient isn't constant. So, yeah. So, so you're right, there's another assumption here, and that is that d is constant, okay? Because in integrating, uh, integrating the rate equation, I assume that the diffusion coefficient was constant. But other than that, where, where does thermodynamics come into this? This is an equilibrium phase diagram, isn't it? And the equilibrium compositions are obtained by drawing a common tangent to the free energy surfaces of alpha and beta. So implicit in that is all the free energy stuff that we did in uh, the first series of lectures. Uh, the composition of the alloy comes in from C note, and kinetics comes in through the diffusion curve. So obviously growth is going to become slower and slower as the diffusion coefficient becomes smaller. But there is a contradiction, you know, because as I as I supercool to a greater undercooling, the driving force will also be increasing. So in fact what happens is that the growth rate follows a C curve behavior. So if I plot the velocity, dx by dt versus temperature, then uh, it will follow a behavior like this. Now, at high temperatures, delta G is small, but D is large, diffusion coefficient is large. At low temperatures, delta G is large, but diffusion coefficient is small. And in between somewhere, there's an optimum combination of diffusivity and driving force. So we get a maximum in the growth rate as a function of temperature. Any questions? Okay, good. See you in the next lecture.